Greetings and welcome back to the Kiss My Aesthetic Podcast. I'm so excited to have fellow 30-year-old Whitney Eckes on the podcast. Welcome, Whitney. Hi, I'm so excited to be on. Oh my gosh. I led with the 30 thing because we have so much to talk about. We just, you just had your 30th birthday. I had mine back in June. Um, we're definitely going to talk about that today, but you also run a marketing agency at Kiss Marketing. Can you tell us who you are, what you do and who you help to kind of kick it off? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm definitely a serial entrepreneur by trade. I've had the marketing agency for the last six years. Um, we really specialize in lifestyle and consumer-based goods, as well as some of San Diego's local hospitality. And more recently, I've been kind of just expanding my wings into different brands and investing. And I have an incredible startup called Get Super that is a CBD infused instant coffee. So yeah, branding, design, all those kind of fun things are in within my realm, which was so fun to bring everything full circle for my 30th birthday and kind of create this really fun, cool branded aesthetic for kind of the acknowledgement of the death of my 20s. And to eventize the milestones that don't get eventized, which we'll definitely talk about. I feel like you and I, we get fired up about similar topics. So we'll definitely <laughs> touch that. But let's give some context for anyone who doesn't isn't totally familiar yet. Where did you start? How did you end up with a marketing agency? Like, is this what did you always know you wanted to work for yourself? Or is this something you kind of stumbled into? No, not at all. In fact, I started really getting my feet wet in the marketing industry when I I took on a job with Red Bull and when I was a sophomore in college. And at that time, you know, social media had really just come to the forefront. You know, we had Facebook, we MySpace was, you know, dying out if not completely dead and then Instagram was on the rise. And so at that point, Red Bull really was into these 360 degree campaigns, which was, you know, events, working with their athletes, making sure that they're doing an event. It's on an on-premise site where people are able to drink Red Bull and really just bringing everything into this whole 360 degree approach. So I got so much experience so fast for working in such a, uh, I guess, established brand environment where I was held to these incredible standards, like looking at budgets, working with talent, you know, conceptualizing different activations, even as like a college student with no experience whatsoever. And a lot of that bled into social media because at that time it was on the rise. So a lot of these things were like, hey, go promote the event to your Facebook group or, you know, have the girls from your floor take photos with the athletes and tag them. There was kind of this like natural progression of social media leading the forefront. So with that, every job I had thereafter, I was bugging people to let me run their social. I worked for Aviator Nation. And then I went back home after college and was um, a rooftop hostess. And then I somehow bled into hospitality and was running 15 properties in the hospitality space for digital marketing. And then by that point, when I was so corporated out, I was like, I'm just ready to do this for myself and work on brands that excite me. And at that mm-hmm. time too, we were seeing, you know, Suja, you know, mm-hmm. rising to the top and Liquid IV was becoming a thing and Copari was out here in San Diego. So there were all these really cool lifestyle um, consumer packaged good brands that I was just getting so excited about and that were just kind of like on my radar of what I could do and what, you know, who I wanted to work with and really go after them. I didn't work with Suja. I mean, I didn't work with Liquid IV or Kopari more or less, but they were definitely brands that inspired me. Yeah. On your radar for sure. San Diego has such a good culture for that. I feel like, yeah. especially like, I feel like we're the capital of lifestyle brands because there's, there, you don't meet anyone that doesn't say that like lifestyle isn't part of their mission in San Diego. 100%. Do you notice this? Yeah. It's very, very intertwined, which is really interesting. Um, so you decide to start Ecos Marketing. You've got this experience, job experience on the corporate side and event side. How did you come up with like kind of your first suite of offerings? Like what is it that Ecos Marketing was doing and how is that different than what you offer now? Yeah. So I mean, immediately when I was in hospitality, I ended up, I mean, I, I didn't take them. They came over with me, five clients from this hospitality group. In fact, the hospitality group was like, can you just keep managing these five? And I was like, absolutely. So that looked like social media. It looked like email marketing and basically content creation. So it was kind of like a glorified social media manager. And that was definitely the direction and service we took it. Now from there, I very much so was like the hard and fast approach of just doing whatever I could and getting whatever work I could get my hands on. So I started doing events. And the first event I did was an influencer event for myself. And we did a whole panel. And that's actually where we got to work with Mm -hmm. Jen Kopari for the first time. Mm -hmm. 
And then from there, I had um, another client that was like, Hey, I'm doing, I want to do an influencer event. I can't pay you. Like, what can we do? And I'm like, you know what? I'll just do it for a case study. So I started taking on these like smaller level services. And then before I knew it, I was offering pilot programs for services that my team and myself hadn't learned and basically giving them to the client at a really, really re- low cost and then learning with them. So one of our biggest case studies to date is we took on Pinterest and Pinterest advertising. And we were able to, I mean, just grow a whole new vertical of business for this one brand. And it was all in this low discounted rate. And they gave us our, you know, they gave us our wings and we were able to really finesse what we're able to do. And so there were quite a few things like that. Get Super was another one where it's like, we took on this brand. We really wanted to go into the branding space. We really wanted to approach what it would look like to take a brand from conception to basically go to market. And we did that. And that was one of our best case studies for, you know, to date in terms of how that, how that looked approach wise. So that was really how I started doing the services. And I think looking back, I would love to be more refined. And I think I took on a lot because I was just very young and ambitious. I mean, I was, I was 22 when I started the agency. So there really wasn't anything off the table. And I, I didn't have a, you know, I think hindsight's always 2020, but like, I, I really had no fear yet. I had no sense of what, what was going to go wrong. So I just went for it. Um, but I think looking at it now, it's like, yeah, there's so much opportunity to grow and expand your services and things that interest you. And there's no wrong way to do it. And I think the best part about doing this pilot program is I was so upfront and honest with my clients that they were willing to learn with us. And so that gave us a whole nother level of trust and transparency. But then also too, we were learning a new service that we were going to be able to capitalize on and double down on what we're able to make. Bingo. I think I, we have a very similar come up story because I am very similar to that. And I preach this all the time on the podcast that when you are offering a new service or a new skill, it is a risk for the client to hire you. So like, yeah. get paid, cover your bases, but realize that like you don't know what you're talking about yet. So if somebody wants to pay you and you still don't know what you're talking about, you cannot come in top of market. And I think I think I totally resonate with that idea of being just like young and ambitious and being like, yeah, I can totally offer this. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes it bites you in the ass and sometimes it oh. ends up totally great. Like I was offering Squarespace website design and then I hated it. I was I, like, I don't want to do this anymore. I've also so, been there for sure. Right. <laughs> right. And there's still days where I wake up and I like look at, you know, I've got to talking to clients, whatever. And they're like, oh, I just want to build like a quick Squarespace site. And I was like, I know I have the skills to do this, but this is just a boundary I've been burned by and I'm not interested in going towards again. <laughs> is there anything that you would never do again? Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, paid ads, paid social media. Oh, yeah. that I will not touch. We'll do like boosting. We'll do a little, like we have these little micro campaigns that we've set up that we just basically copy and paste for certain clients that just want a little boost. But I mean, we really at one point were like, we saw the boom of paid social and it, and I mean, it is such an awesome art. And if you are someone that is experienced in that, just double down because people are always looking for incredible Mm -hmm. paid social people. But it was just something where we're like, this is either going to become a whole leg of the business in and of itself. And we're going to have to really dive into it, or we're just not going to offer it. And after an offer, we're like, great. Yeah. I think even to just the a number of years that you and I have each been in business, like how different it is from you saying like you were like a catch-all social media coordinator, essentially for these brands to like now the role of social media, like you could be referring to 20 different people's jobs. Mm-hmm. Like that department in its own cannot no longer fall on just one person. Do you agree? No, a thousand percent. I think it was Okay. So again, I'm like going back to, let's just say like 2016, I think I, I think I started the agency in 2017, if if my memory serves. And I remember I was talking to like Marriott and Hilton and talking to them about why it was important to be on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I think back in those days, yeah, that could have been a one person job because it wasn't the marketing like vertical or the way in which we were searching for things and we were looking at things and we were taking, you know, reputation into account and searching, whatever wasn't through social media like it is today. And now it's almost coming down to the point where it's like each individual platform almost needs its designated person because now content is also becoming more diversified. And we're also Mm -hmm. looking at how much time and effort it requires for a brand to show up in the right way to this community and then the different variations of community that come with the platform. So 
hundred percent, it was one of the most underrated jobs. And I don't think anyone truly saw it coming until it was here. And now it's like the scramble effect of like people that get social get social, but it is such a high just burnout rate because there's mm-hmm. not a lot of support on the back end. And uh, brands mm-hmm. that also understand that though, and that build out social media divisions are the ones that are thriving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do any brands come to mind of like brands that you currently have crushes on that are just killing it? Yes. I love Doe, the cookie dough yeah, company. Of course. I just course. think that there has just been such an amazing come up story. I think Olipop was a brand that I used to crush on. I still crush on, but I think that they took a very similar approach. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, so Poppy I, is, Poppy's kind of stolen their thunder though. Don't you think? I would definitely say so. And I think that I think Poppy kills them with the flavor. Yeah. Um, I think Olipop yeah. has a really unique flavor and then Poppy kind of stole that, but I functional beverages right now are just having such a moment. I mean, it's, it's it is your so sweet incredible. spot. Let's talk, let's talk more about that. How did you even start get super? Like, how does that story even begin? And then tell us about Mela as well, because I know that's yeah. a big part, big interest for you. So, um, talk about, cause I, as a foodie, like I, I'm such a sucker for like a good grocery store. Like I will, um, I will cruise through a grocery store the way that some some women go to like the shoe department at Nordstrom. I, was just, I don't care about shoes. I care about food. So tell us about your interest specifically in beverages and how you ended up with those two companies. Absolutely. So Get Super was definitely a passion project turned like just healing journey. Yeah. Um, so I was diagnosed in 2020 with severe anxiety and depression. It runs in my family. There's just been a lot that like came up through those times. And obviously with 2020, so much had come up. Um, I also had just lost like 75% of our business with the agency. Like we were struggling. Everything just really came full circle. And I was like, like, what am I like? I have to literally rechange my entire life because the way that I've been living was just so unsustainable. And so after the diagnosis, I decided, you know, I wasn't going to go on antidepressants or medication. And that's just because there's a history of addiction in my family. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I looked at the holistic approach. And one of the first things I started doing was playing with CBD and having it Inner, you know, and using it into my routine in the moments where I was most anxious. So mm-hmm. first thing in the morning, then as I started really looking into the effects of, well, what happens when caffeine hits your system? What happens when you have, you know, these program behavior responses to opening up your inbox and getting on a morning call and things like that? There's a lot of things that happen within our nervous system that can be calmed down and that can be kind of healed. So I was dropping liquid CBD into my coffee every morning and get super was actually a brand that i had acquired so we okay. i was i had worked with him at one other event and i i really had loved the the logo that was the only thing we didn't do to get super was that that g mm-hmm. and the s p r and i remember thinking like his cbd coffee i started taking it, it was great and it was actually a higher bioavailability meaning that when you take CBD oil, it breaks down. Mm-hmm. Um, same, similar to like cooking oil, right? Breaks down with heat. It, it, it expands and whatnot. So when you take CBD oil, it's not as high high of a bioavailability. So it's not you're not getting all the effects. Hmm. When you use a water soluble powder, it actually goes into the bloodstream and is more more bioavailable. So interesting. Really interesting. And it activates with heat. It actually opens up. So his water soluble hemp extract in the instant coffee was just something that I felt the effects immediately. And I love drinking and I'm a coffee holic. I was drinking like two, three cups of coffee a day. Same, same. And I just felt like too, at that moment, I was like, I really don't want to switch to mud water. I really don't want to switch to an alternative that I don't love. And I really want to keep this morning ritual. So mm-hmm. that's where we basically decided to double down and acquire it. And it really helped. And it's been a really incredible journey. And it's also taught me so much as an entrepreneur and looking at what it takes to run not just one, but two things. And especially from a startup perspective, it's it's been very, very interesting, very fun. But yes, no less, fell in love with functional beverages. Um, Get Super was one of our best case studies. And again, we got picked up really quick and really fast. And that even led into Mella, okay. which Mella is a canned watermelon water company. And our fr- he's a family, the founder is a family friend. And he had kind of been watching what I had been doing and watching my journey. He shares a similar journey in entrepreneurship and just in his own mental health as well. And he felt like for such an interesting product. And again, with Get Super, I'm kind of glossing over the hardships that is owning a CBD company on top uh, of- Yeah, that's a thing. whole lot of hurdles. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, 
A lot. And the marketing tactics are different. So a lot of it's like the direct to consumer approach and really building the brand and building the story and like putting myself out there as the story. So there was, there was a lot of building. There was a lot of marketing and storytelling in, in that and what we were doing. And that was just so that we could get by with like the base level of sales because we really had our hands tied behind our back in terms of marketing. So once he saw that, me and him got together and he goes, okay, I just bought a company similar to you. I'm going to be launching it. Here's what we're doing. Also, you know, do you want to help build this brand? And I was like, absolutely. Like, let's get Mm -hmm. started. So we started working on Mela. Um, I think it was like me and like one or two other of the first employees that were on the ground floor. And we built it up to what it is as, and, and I mean, granted, I did a lot of the marketing. I did a lot of the foundational building but I got to give it to the founder. He's been able to take it and scale it in such a beautiful, incredible way. And all the sales team and everyone there, they just really knew how to double down on distribution and really understanding who was going to be the consumer that was going to be drinking Mela and how to make it in a fun, playful way, which I think, again, if you look at their branding, if you look at the taste, if you look at the way that Mel is being consumed, it is so unlike anything in its own vertical that it's actually opening people up to this idea that like watermelon water is a thing. There's mm-hmm. really one other, mm-hmm. one other brand in the space and the rest is mainly coconut water or right. juice. So that's been a really incredible experience and to see them absolutely take off and just see the way that the brand has continues to evolve and just the consumer feedback has been really spectacular. You mentioned distribution, scale, all of those things like stockists and 3PLs and all of that. (laughs) I know just enough information to be dangerous in that area just by proxy of the clients, but it's a space that's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that, again, it gets totally glossed over, like completely overlooked when you're just seeing a glossy brand on Instagram. Like, mm-hmm. or just like a really well done TikTok account. Like you, that's not always the whole picture. Can you think of maybe some things that clients come to you or some misconceptions about what it actually means to like be an owner of a brand, but also to help market a brand that you feel like clients like constantly are like hitting their heads against the same wall? Because I know what ours are yeah. with our client. And so it's a lot of like dispelling myths, but do you have ones that come to mind that you're consistently sharing? Yeah. In fact, there's two brands right now. Um, well, I guess kind of three. There's there's one that I'm not consulting with, but I have been following and I'm absolutely in love with. It's actually one of my, friend, my friend's company and she's just done such a phenomenal job launching this brand. And then there's two right now where they, we're consulting with them from this perspective, mainly because of Get Super and Mela and then the marketing agency. So I bring that kind of bridge of understanding the sure. hurdles of ownership as, as well as the hurdles of operations, which to be completely frank, looking at Get Super's operation versus Mela operation, operation they are night and day different. Really? Okay. So be- a canned beverage versus, versus like an actual powder pack, paper package type is sure. just, it's wildly different. But all that to say is when we look at marketing from let's just say from a startup, right? Where it's a new brand, we're going to market or we're on market, we're new, we're still acquiring market share, still learning what the consumer likes and dislikes about the product. It's really easy to lean into this aspect of let's go hard and fast on the marketing. Let's be the next poppy. Let's Mm -hmm. do all the very sexy, but yet very expensive things that Mm -hmm. are going to make us pop off. And Mm -hmm. there's a way of doing that. In fact, that is something that I did with Get Super out of the gate. Now, that was something where I kind of had to learn from those mistakes and also very quickly understand that I was actually allowed to do that part. And it did kind of pay off because I didn't have the traditional marketing sense. When I say traditional marketing sense for CBD, I mean, like, I don't, I can't pay to advertise. My mm-hmm. verbiage and the way that I'm able to share about the product is very different. There's a lot of different legalities around it. Whereas Mela, you know, again, we had this conversation where we were like sitting down and saying, okay, should we do paid advertising? Is it time to, you know, really invest in a big influencer or a big celebrity? You know, who are we talking to? And we, I mean, we talk to a bunch of talent. We talk to a bunch of different people and really, you know, from the founder's perspective, he made the, he made the decision to really approach it from a sales perspective mm-hmm. versus investing so much and burning mm-hmm. the brand out through too mm-hmm. much marketing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a huge misconception because again, my natural brain, and I'm sure your natural brain goes, but the marketing is great. It's needed. The storytelling is absolutely there. And yes, there's an element of that, but there's so many grassroots approaches that I think that brands could be taking and take really taking into consideration before kind of exercising these large scale efforts. 
Does that make because sense? The, yeah, because the operations is the unsexy stuff, right? It's it the is. spreadsheets, it's the workflows, it's the relationships, it's the stockists, it's the like, it's the stuff that's also you're not as prone to want to promote or highlight, right? Because that's mm-hmm. your inner workings, that's the machine. So I think I think I end up talking to a lot of clients and potential clients that they feel so passionately about their business, but at the end of the day, they really want to be just like the founder that gets to come out at the party and be like, hey, oh, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. they're not all that interested in the nitty gritty and the background and the mm-hmm. all of that stuff. And so to fix that or to, or to kind of remedy that, I think, again, it's like a testament to the fact that we have agencies and we've had agencies for so long because a lot of people start them and close them. But the thing is, is like you have to have the process, you have to have the systems, you have to have the talent and the team and the 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 discipline to like mm-hmm. see things through because if you don't yeah you can post like a glossy portfolio page all day long but if you have no way of like actually retaining anybody as a client or turning out consistent good work then it's all for naught mm-hmm. you know what absolutely. i mean absolutely and i mean those 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 people and everyone in the operation are actually they are the make or break of the brand mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was really cool. I got to work with a husband and wife duo. Um, they now have their own consulting agency for how they help with distribution and how they get products on cool. shelf. That's it's cool. so cool. And they have honestly taught me so much just by by proxy or working with them that now they have become like my number one referral for brands because they just get it and they have those relationships and they understand the structure inside of businesses. And again, if we're, t- if we're talking especially beverage category, it's heavy. There's yeah. so many things that could go wrong. I mean, poppy is not shelf stable. Like it has to be right. refrigerated. Right. So there's so many factors of that that come down to it that I think that, yeah, there's so much done in the background that we don't appreciate. We're just looking at the social and we're like, wait, that's super cool and super sexy. But it took poppy. I mean, if you've ever, I'm sure you've listened to their story, oh, but yeah. her story is insane. Like yeah. just what she's done to build a brand and the way that she's, you know, doubled down on bringing in more and more investors and things like that just to get the brand to the point where she wants it to be. So I feel like, again, there's just, there's so much that we're missing, but going back to, I think, again, looking at the grassroots, looking at what you're going to do in terms of your brand and how you're going to reach people. I mean, cash is still king. So where are your sales at? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could be as sexy as you want and mm-hmm. it could look as great as you want it to look, mm-hmm. but what's really going on behind the scenes? Mm-hmm. Looking forward, how do you mm-hmm. predict this space is going to either stay the same or change in the next, let's call it next five years? Yeah, I get really excited because I mean, I, you talk about how like you, you know, you'd rather go into a grocery store than like a Nordstrom, right? And I think, um, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with this brand, but I like I loved pop up grocers concept. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I, and from there, you know, I mean, Air One's been around forever, but now Air One is the trending topic. And, you know, before that, it was kind of Whole Foods. So I feel like we're not done in this category. In fact, I think, if anything, you're going to see it scale out to be more and more concepts, whether it's a bougie or more upscale experience, or if it's more small brands coming to the table, more, um, I shouldn't say small, but like... I talked to someone recently who said that their grocery store serves glasses of wine. And that the cart has a cutout for you to put your wine glass in it while what? you're grocery shopping. And Wait, I'm where like, where's the grocery store? Ba- bury me there. Yeah. Like, bury me. <laughs> I would just live in there. I would take every Bumble date there. Uh-huh. I would just and do see that. what they were going to buy. And that's what like, what are you going to buy? Flag? What are you interested in? <laughs> what do you think is like outrageously overpriced? What's your opinion on CMOS gel? Like, I feel like you would learn so much about someone so fast if you could just like get a little buzzed in the grocery store. 100%. I right? could not agree more, but I, and I, to that point, yeah, I don't think, I think that the way that we consume, I mean, it's been the same way with hospitality. I mean, look at the hospitality mm-hmm. scene, your local mm-hmm. from San Diego, look at the way that it's changed over the last five years, mm-hmm. same versus everywhere. So mm-hmm. I think that the way that we consume, I mean, food is still what we live on. It's our, it's our survival mechanism, but now we just have so many options that we're starting to categorize and niche down into what like is our thing or what specialty item are we going after? So and I think food is just as much a status symbol as the car you drive, the clothes you wear, 100%. the places you hang out, like all of that. They're all signals, right? It's like whether you have like whatever grocery bag you have as a symbol of like, do you have the aloe bag that everybody has? Like, you know what I mean? It's so funny how many of these things are stereotypes. I'm curious how you feel like social media might change or stay different, just like social media on a whole platforms, the way that we do messaging, like what do you think is on the horizon? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely don't think that social media is a bubble. 
I think right. that if anything, it's just continuing to grow vines into different a- avenues. I thought, you know, what was really interesting was threads. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought lemonade was a really interesting concept, but I don't see this type of new social media concept slowing anytime soon. I right. think in fact, there's going to be so many more. What I do think though, for a brand, it's that it's very crucial to understand where you're going to live and how you're going to live there. And what's worth the investment? Because I think, again, we saw so many brands running to threads and Twitter or X or whatever you want to refer to it Mm -hmm. as is still here. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of people that have that made that jump, but their time allocation is still toward Twitter X or whatever. So I think that that's not going to change. And I think these giant social media, you know, whatever conglomerates are going to stick around. But I think that there will be a diversification in how we continue to connect socially. And I think that although it's every entrepreneur's like worst nightmare to have to create content for all the places, Mm -hmm. you really have to approach each differently. Because you cannot yeah. just copy paste the content from from spot to spot to spot. Um, but understanding that like who your user, is, who your customer, your client is on threads versus X versus Instagram versus TikTok. Like those are all those all could be very much different people. 100%. Absolutely. And I think that there's also a beauty in that, right? Yeah. I think right now we're, you know, we've already seen the rise of the influencer. Now we're seeing the, you know, the diversification of influencers from vloggers to TikTokers, X, Y, and Z. But I think there's also a lot to be said where a brand can have very specific audiences in different places and Mm -hmm. you can treat it differently. Like you can be silly and wild and, you know, a little unhinged on TikTok and still have this insanely beautiful corporate style, you know, glossy LinkedIn. Like mm-hmm. you can have both. And so mm-hmm. I think that there's an element to that that can be embraced. And I think instead of looking at it to your point of like, this is going to burn me out. Like where are the people that you can put in the right spots that are going to let the let these different categories shine? Or hire the people that like those spaces. Yeah, I mean, exactly. we're at the point now where my team, finally, we're at the point where they're helping with the social. And I was like, this is great because this has always fallen like fell on my shoulders and I Instagram is what made me like for sure like I think we're all of that uh, the era of like having a business account on Instagram was like you needed it but it used to be that you'd you'd go to someone's website you go to their Instagram to see if they were legit now it's you're on someone's Instagram or their TikTok now you're going to see their website to see that they're actually legit it's like flip-flop yeah which I think is interesting but also that um that it's a lot to ask one person to be all the things in all the places all the time and do a day job like that's, that's yeah, a lot. It's a lot it's, of work. It's not, that's not a thing. <laughs> even for the ones of us that are in the industry, like I can't even, so yeah. now getting their help, like now having someone on my team that helps with the Facebook group engagement, that helps create the carousels for Instagram, that helps to create the concepting for TikTok. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> so I was just yeah. getting total, like definitely approaching burnout. And I think that that's, that's very common. Um, And I think I have this debate with my dad all the time because he worked corporate, like marketing, like in the nineties. And he's like, you know, the marketing department, like why isn't there anybody who can just do all the jobs? And I'm like, dad, that just like has not <laughs> existed in so long. Like yeah. you don't expect your electrician to do plumbing. Like you hire yeah, a plumber. No. So like mm-hmm. no one knows how to build your whole house. So you can't expect like one person to be able to do all That's your stuff. That's a great analogy. That's an amazing analogy for what that is. And you're so spot. And again, it's not stopping anytime soon. If anything, our yeah. marketing efforts are getting, again, more and more diversified and what we're doing. So it, it, it does take a village, right? Right. Right. I think also a lot of people like debate that like there's so much social media, there's so much virtual people are taking detoxes. I think at the same time, like people are doing events, like mm-hmm. you and I are big in people, in person people. Um, um, so talk to us about events, talk to us about your event specifically for oh. your birthday. Cause I want to give time to that before we end up on a whole like tangent about <laughs> social media yeah. marketing. So events have just been just my love language, like to say in short, I've always done them. I don't, I think maybe because there's just this element of chaos that I thrive in. And I talk about that openly. I think that's also what makes me a great entrepreneur is just the ability to have a lot of thrown at me and somehow seamlessly move through it. Um, And not always seamlessly, but I try my best. And so with events, there's that kind of same air. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of moving parts. There's things that are always going wrong. Um, and I've just kind of come to fall in love with it. And even still to this day, I think I've only missed like one or two client events and I'm usually always there hands on. So when it came to my 30th birthday, 
I was like, I basically had my my dad and my boyfriend approach me and be like, can we throw your birthday party? Like, we really want to do something special. And I was like, I love you both so much, but, but no, <laughs> but like, that, like that's like taking something away from me. Right. So right. once I kind of put it into perspective for them, they were like, okay. So I decided that we really wanted this to kind of be this this change in era and kind of like rebirth and celebration. And this whole year I've been talking a lot on my personal channels about calling in like this quantum leap. And Mm -hmm. that really was because I felt like a lot of my twenties, I had just been building and really navigating and really trying to understand like who Whitney is. And now that I'm at this place in my life, I really wanted to kind of have this like rebirth of like, no, this is like who I am. And mm-hmm. I really want to celebrate these parts of me that are like who, who exactly I am. So I was so excited to be working with you because I was like, I have this vision. I need someone mm-hmm. to like bring the brand to life. And mm-hmm. I remember like you coined the term like gritty glam. And like that yeah. was such this like part of me that I was like, wow, someone like, like was able to see that and like pull it out of me and like and coin it and make it into something. So, I mean, from the 30th birthday, we decided we were going to do this whole photo shoot. We had you design this incredible mm-hmm. logo. I'm obsessed with dirty martinis. Um, and so we had you draw me into a dirty martini. It was and so good. I don't even know if that was your idea. I think it was your idea because I think you had me send over a Pinterest Yeah. Board. Well, I was trying to find like the center of the Venn diagram because I feel like such mm-hmm. so much of branding is about like mishmashing totally disparate ideas into one thing, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And so for my birthday, that was very much like I've always been obsessed with Italy. Like I loved White Lotus. I was like, it has to be this, and it has to be bright and bold and loud and all these things. I and then knew, when I was I, thinking, your videos were the reason why I even like approached you. I was like, if she did this for her birthday, I was like, I'm going to do this for mine. <laughs> oh, my friends know it's been a long time coming too because I told them. Like years ago, I said, I'm not having like, I don't know when I'm getting married, if I'm getting married. I said, but I will have like a blowout 30th birthday, like a whole deal. Because I just, uh, why would you want to wait until another person comes along to like celebrate yourself? Hell no. So I was like, this is what's happening. You guys are all invited. I was like, I'm covering the place. Just get your ass there. Like, that's all. That's all I'm asking. And then we totally like took it and took it to the nth degree and like Mm -hmm. leveraged it for forever. It was wild. But yeah, with yours, I was like, oh, I know what this is. This is like kind of the center of the Venn diagram of like, like kind of the, like I said, more like gritty, a little bit grunge with glam disco with what could be those two things that's also san diego and i think i was in down this whole rabbit hole of kind of this like tattoo culture like downtown like history of san diego vibe and found that illustration of the girl in the martini glass i was like oh duh like this is what it is. <laughs> we've got to find and so i was like we got to do our own version of this and that totally yeah. came together but talk to us about the other parts talk to us about what it was like to review that presentation the first time through i mean it was just stunning i i think again too like you know with a with a branding a personal brand versus a product totally it's so different because you're also playing with elements that are like my personality, like my, my social, my Instagram. And a lot of that too, like wasn't perfectly curated. So there was a lot going on in in the mix of like, who is Whitney? Um, But I think the elements that were so fun were the like merch and, Mm -hmm. you know, the overall vision and then bringing in all these small details, which is honestly quintessential for a great event. And I think, mm-hmm. again, like as long as I've been doing these events, the things that people remember most are those Instagrammable moments. It's mm-hmm. you know, the stir sticks, the cocktail disc, the photo mm-hmm. wall, the, the badass, you know, sunglasses that mm-hmm. you designed. It's the, you know, the cups and the elements. And so it kind of just marries all of it together. And so when looking through that deck, I was honestly, I was like, this is everything I want. And I want you to bring more because I was like, I think we had like, I don't think we ended up doing all of them, but I, I swear uh-huh. we had like 25 merch items. Like we just oh, I couldn't. Going. Yeah. I couldn't like bring it in at all. Oh, and this is, this is so my problem. This is my greatest strength. And my biggest downfall is someone gives me a lick of an idea and like, I can't help myself, but I, I call it like, I have like a, that's so Raven moment where I'm like, And like I (laughs) zoom in and I'm like, I know what this looks like. I literally, this just happened today. We were on the call with our real estate client there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've made all these like little badge icons because they, their USP is that their competitors are really corporate real estate 
groups, Compass, Sotheby's, yeah. these like kind of where they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. And these three individuals that are FRG team, they are local Milwaukee, like 25 years. Like they're so passionate about being so knowledgeable about the area. I was like, okay, we got to play that up. So we yeah. made each neighborhood, we made it its own like little badge icon. Oh my and so God. they're having like, they're having a launch event for they're selling like these six properties in a row. And they're like, oh, we need a banner design. And I was like, well, do you need a banner design or do you also need, <laughs> I was like, do you need print and do you need digital? And can yeah. you give, cause they're trying to find a way to like unveil their branding, like leak mm-hmm. it out slowly and then have a moment. And so I said, we've got to make baseball caps with the badges of the neighborhood for the people that come to the okay. event. Because then do you, you know, the drive auto care hat, Mitch yeah. from drive. Mm-hmm. Auto- I was like, this guy is so smart. Like he went to every event with two baseball caps with just yep. his logo on the trucker hat. And then yep. it, became a status symbol of Solana beach to like own one of these hats because then you would see someone in the grocery store or at the dog park or at the beach and be like, Oh yeah, Mitch, like, you know, this guy. And so it just becomes this cultural. When I explained that today on the call, the client mm-hmm. was like, like <laughs> mind blown and that because like, it, so it's just like the little bread crumbing. Yeah. And that's such a testament to like your superpower. Like, I feel like also too, that's like probably some of the best pieces of advice you could give anyone is like, there's these things where you're like, why am I like this? And okay, yeah. mine, I could thrive in chaos. That yeah. doesn't seem like a great trait, but it's actually perfect for where I'm at in my life. Same thing with you. You're like, I can take anything and it literally comes to me and what it's supposed to look like, which right. is and find that and love it and appreciate it and grow totally. with it. Totally. And then I could see my business manager who was also on the call being like, okay, <laughs> she's like <laughs> trying to take notes. <laughs> she's like, Michelle, you just signed them on for thousands of dollars of a totally different scope of work. Like, are you yeah. sure? And I was like, yeah. trust, just trust me. Like, this is um, the vibe that we need to go for because those merch items, they do, they mm-hmm. like, especially in a world with, of so much consumerism and so much bullshit. We talked about like how mm-hmm. it used to be that like your realtor would just give you like that magnet grocery list that you'd like stick on your fridge. Like, mm-hmm. I remember having like oh, yeah. my parents having drawers of these like in the 90s, early yeah. 2000s. I was like, let's give people things that they actually want that like mm-hmm. they seek out. Like who wouldn't want a hat with like, like I think of the seaside market hats even like it's such yeah. a signifier of like being a local and being hyper local. And mm-hmm. so I was like, we got to like tie that into your company somehow. So as soon as I explained that, they were like super on board, which is really oh, fun. Oh my gosh. That yeah. is so awesome. That's good stuff. Can you think of projects recently or things that you've done where you're like, damn, we crushed that? Oh, I mean, one of my favorite, one of my favorite projects that we've done recently, and it was just so good is, and this is not necessarily like a merch item or an actual like product based. Well, I guess it's product based. We did a collaboration with House Chris. She's on TikTok. She's like kind of notoriously known for having the walking treadmill, going and getting a Diet Coke break. She Mm -hmm. drinks like the pebble ice. Like she's just kind of this quintessential, like, work from home girly that like Mm -hmm. kind of just champions all the work from home girlies. And I remember we were working with Sonics. It's a phone case company, Mm -hmm. an accessory company. And we were really looking at the Sonics consumer. And a lot of the Sonics consumer had, you know, they were like the first to like partner with like rifle paper company and kind of this millennial girl. And now this millennial girl is like kind of growing up. And so they were kind of like losing a little bit of sight of like who their consumer was. And so we decided that we were going to partner with House Chris. We were going to do this phone case collab and it just went gangbusters. And it was nice. just kind of like this re-envision of like looking at your community and kind of also championing them, but also bringing them a product that's really going to fit in their life now, even though like you had kind of grown up with them and things, a lot of things have changed and matured, but then they're kind of like coming back. It was just this really cool kind of novel campaign and it worked out beautifully. So that was something that we were like, this is awesome. We Amazing. Love. I feel like there's two lessons to learn from that. There's like the, the brand lesson and the creator lesson. Mm-hmm. I feel like the lesson on the brand side is to, first of all, trust someone like yourself or myself to help bring those, those things come to light. Right. But Always. to like be able to lean into the creator that has that hyper specific signature thing. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's way happening way more on TikTok anyway than it is on Instagram of Mm -hmm. like, there's actually so much beauty in being repetitive and doing the same things and showcasing the thing that you think is boring. I think that's Mm -hmm. a hang up for a lot of content creators. And then on the creator side, too, it's like working with the brands that fit seamlessly into your stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. I think like a lot of times, too, there's so many marketers or so many people within brands where they want to get hung up on like the big 
like the big ones, like the sure. Alex Earls sure, and, sure, sure. you know, things like that. And, and in retro or actually like in reality, it's kind of like these smaller creators can be some of your biggest champions. There's been some creators that we've kind of heard through the grapevine where they're not, you know, one specifically to look at just because of their numbers, but they've actually grown and scaled brands. Mm-hmm. And they've able to do this by that, by, you know, Mm -hmm. having a really niche following by, you know, being that ambassador of the brand and really partnering on with the brand to help them grow and scale. And those are obviously kind of the unicorn finds in terms of the influencer partnership world. But I think that there's a lot of times where you don't necessarily have to go after these huge, huge, huge budget paid talent. And you can really look at who's kind of in your own neighborhood or your own backyard that's going to really, you know, bring light to the brand and showcase it in the right way. And move the needle because that's that's what I have to get mm-hmm. back to with the clients. It's like, oh, is your goal to go viral or is your goal to actually make sales? Because yeah. the two things are not the same. Like, Absolutely. and if you do go viral, like we said earlier, you can't even guarantee that you can satisfy that kind of demand. So I'd much rather see slow, steady growth than like a huge spike and then people having a negative brand interaction because their stuff that they ordered got back ordered for six weeks. Like that's yep. not a good feeling either. So Absolutely. there's some misnomers in that. If someone came to you and said, Whitney, I'm, I'm going to launch my brand tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I I'm starting at zero clean slate. I have no idea what to do. How do I get my, my stuff out there for people to see? What's your first recommendation? Okay. What kind of brand are we launching? Ooh, <laughs> let's go. Let's go consumer package. Good. Let's go okay. something you'd find it at a lazy acres or a seaside or a, a whole foods. It's a something it's a snack. Let's go with that. Okay. So if we're launching tomorrow, my first thing was just have everything look presentable as possible. Like sure. have your MVP you know, have your socials, have everything dialed. Um, Second, I would say, start reaching out to friends and family and everyone within your network. The best time to launch a brand is always the launch because everyone gets so excited. And it is that clean slate that people are like so excited to do whatever it is to support the brand. So for example, you know, reach out to them, maybe get them the product, ask for a review or have them go purchase at whatever store they're at. Whatever it is, like just reach for that low hanging fruit. And then from that point, engage that community, like really, really engage that community. Like your friends and your family are like your number one circle. And like, that's the yeah. circle of trust for a brand. And that network opens up and fingers out to so many more people. And mm-hmm. that's also too, one of the ways that we've looked at the approach from Get Super and with Mela. In fact, Mela grew exponentially just from the founder's own network of who he was friends with and who he could really kind of put a can in their hand to try. So Mm -hmm. I would say that that's kind of the low hanging fruit. And then in terms of like the actual marketing, like look at who you want to talk to and go out and talk to them, whether it's in person, whether it's on social, some of the coolest people that we worked with, with, with for get super were like traveler. And Mm -hmm. and there was like one that was like a comedian that smoked a lot of weed. Like there was like a bunch of people that we were actually able to connect with that saw so much value in the product that Mm -hmm. opened us up to really incredible campaigns or content creation or just them sharing the product to their community. I love that suggestion. I think that it's definitely overlooked. And I think it's something that I feel like I need to get back into is the networking part of it. That's how you and I originally connected. How often are you out in like boots on the ground networking these days? Because I'm feeling, I know I'm feeling really rusty. I feel, I feel like there used to be so many cool events and maybe it's just that I've matured more in my business and I have a team and like, I'm being more specific about who I'm, who and where I'm spending my time. But Mm -hmm. I miss that culture of like the 2017 to 19, like drop an event and meet 50 women that have amazing businesses. I don't feel like that that's been missing for a long time. Do you agree? I would definitely agree. And I I remember, I remember that time exactly because I Mm -hmm. do remember that there were so many events in San Diego that like I, I couldn't keep up and I met so many people that I'm still friends with to this day. So I would say, yeah, I would say that, yeah, it's not, it's not here, at least in San Diego right now. Um, but I would or also is it say that, that we've just like matured and now we need the next iteration, which is like dirty martinis at the racetrack. Like if that's where this <laughs> has to go, I'm not mad. I'm you not might mad. be right. You might be right? a thousand percent right. Maybe it's just like, maybe they are there, but they're just, it's just we've evolved. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's Good there. I think also too, it's like that generation that is in their very, very early twenties where we're now approaching the thirties is doing it a very different way. 
Of course. And you're doing it at a different pace and you're doing it at a different, like it, it is a necessity because that is going to be the make or break if you get a client or not. Whereas I think when you're a little bit more established, you've got obviously a bigger network, bigger network is more opportunities. And so there's less motivation to want to get out in the community and do it. But every time I go to one, I'm glad that I do. Like yeah, that's same. the thing. That's the thing. Always. So I've got my eyes on the like Encinitas Chamber of Commerce email. I'm like, all right, is it time to just like actually get back out there? But then, but then, you know what stops me from going? I was like, Ugh, I have to make business cards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm the designer. Like, I'm the designer. And I'm like, oh shit, I got to make business cards. <laughs> see, mine is like just the pure, I'm, I'm like, I, I say this, I'm a great networker when I like absolutely need to be, but I'm such yeah. a like social resistance person. So like mm. mine is like, I have to actually go into the event where people and meet them. Like once I meet them, I'm fine. But yeah. It's just the resistance of like actually going. Getting and like started. Winning. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you need an accountability buddy, you know where to find me. <laughs> but, but naturally San Diego, if you've been to any of their events, their events are fabulous. So, so they're good. all like natural foods. You've been before or? Yeah. So I actually, yeah. so one of my really good friends and I, she was the one that brought the chapter to San Diego. Cool. Very helped cool. build it. I helped out with their initial, like for the first like initial year, just on different small tasks and whatnot. But they're yeah. they're an incredible organization. Yeah, incredible. that's been cool because you meet all kinds of people from different places, and there's usually good like food and samples there. So that's oh, that yeah. makes me happy. Um, well, where can everyone <laughs> find you, follow you, connect with you? And I forgot to ask you the question we were supposed to ask on every podcast, and I always forget is one thing you do well and one thing you'd like to get better at, and then plug yourself. Oh my that? gosh! Mm. I think one thing I do well is I see opportunities opportunity and pretty much everything. In fact, that's kind of one of my faults is that I can pretty, I can find the silver lining and whatever there is. Um, one thing I'd like to be getting better at is actually this year, I'm going to practice saying no. Um, oh, I'm going to practice. Goes. <laughs> I know I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice, um, really monitoring my time and my energy. Um, again, I thrive in chaos. So a lot of times it's just always, yes, it's always added onto the plate. And this year we're going to say, we're going to say graciously, no, but thank mm-hmm. you. And mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you guys can find me just on all my personal channels. It's just at Whitney Eckes. You guys can stock the agency at Eckes Marketing. Find Get Super at G-E-T-S-U-P-R. Um, and Mela, as well as all the other brands that I help and work with, um, are in my bio. So definitely go check them out. Love that. Well, thanks so much for your time. I won't take too much more uh, on a work day. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thanks everyone for listening and we'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.